Okay, so this afternoon we're going to talk about the ZJID consistency protocol and concurrent modification and execution of instructions. RISC-V's ISA supports incoherent instruction and data fetching and caching. So we're going to need some way, when you create new instructions and data, to get the iFetchers up to date and catch them up. That's what this is about. This is a clean sheet of paper replacement for the current fence.i. <clears throat> the proposed set of instructions are universal. If you want to have fully coherent ID, you can do that. If you want to have fully incoherent ID, you can do that. If you want to do something in the middle, God help you, but you can do that too. Before we begin, we're going to have to talk about something called the point of instruction visibility for you ARM people. That's called the point of unification. That's the place where you've got to take your modified data that's your new instructions and push it to so that all the iFetchers will now see it once we clear the iCaches. So let's build some new instructions. So the first thing you do is you do a store that creates your new instructions. Now, of course, that means only the data side can see it so far. After that, you're going to execute one of our new lovely cache control instructions, clean ID. Clean ID is going to take that modification, push it down to the point of instruction visibility. We have a new fence here because there was no way I was going to tie this up with fence RWRW. So we've got a fence here, this completion fence, actually, that insists that all of these are done everywhere before any of these instructions execute. After that, we're going to invalidate the I caches with this new cache control instruction, invel.i. Then we have yet another fence here to keep the stuff down here from happening in a minute. So top to bottom, we're going to store the new instructions. We're going to push them down where we know people will fetch them. Then we're going to blow away the I caches so that they will fetch them. Now, once we've done that, we need to execute this, these instructions either on the local heart or on a separate heart remotely. Two ways. If we're going to execute it on a separate heart remotely, you just do a store to a flag that tells that other heart, hey, come and get it. The instructions are ready. If you're not going to execute it on that, you're going to execute it on the local heart. We have an instruction here called import.i. Import.i is designed to clear out any stale instructions that are after the i cache, but in your execution pipes that haven't executed yet. This inval.i that we executed, this inval.i we executed on this heart, did not clear out those pipes this instruction does, and then we can branch to the new instructions. So what does that other consumer heart look like? It's what you expect. Your classic load compare branch polling loop that you learned in CS school, and then the import.i on this heart, because once again, we wiped out the i caches on all the hearts with the inval.i, but we did not wipe out the post i cache pipes on this processor or on the heart that we did this on originally. And then we do our import.i to clean it up, and we branch to the new instructions. Now, this pattern right here, this set of instructions here, I'm going to call that publishing and set of instructions. That pattern is going to occur over and over and over in this talk. So everything you've heard about before is what you do when you're modifying instructions and you're not executing them at the same time. Let's say the loader, for example. That's what the loader is going to do. But JITs have this annoying tendency to modify instructions while they're executing them. So it turns out you're going to wind up needing a whole set of rules for how that works and how that's defined. First rule we're going to need is an instruction modification rule. This is going to be a set of rules that tells the software what stores it can do at what alignment to modify instructions that might be concurrently executed. The next instruction rule is going to be the instruction fetch atomicity rule. The instruction fetch atomicity rule is how much and how atomic the fetches in from the core have to be in your iFetch unit. Now, these two rules together, if you follow them all, are designed to keep you from tearing an instruction in half and winding up with half of the old instruction and half of the new instruction, which is a bad day. We'll have one more set of rules, or one more rule called the fetch ordering rule. We'll need this to make JITs work. But we'll come to that later in the presentation. So this is what software has to do. That's what hardware has to do. I'm not going to read you this slide and put you to sleep, but this is the set of rules for what software can and can't do when they're doing C mod X. Notice it only works in coherent memory. And the other thing to note, the short version of this is if you're going to modify an instruction, modify the whole thing and do it atomically, please. Don't cut it in half. So that was the software. Now, the hardware, what did it have to do? What the hardware does is, if your program counter is on a 4-byte boundary, you grab the next 4 bytes atomically. If that's a 4-byte instruction, great, execute it, and then move the program counter over 4 bytes or go wherever the branch goes. If it's a 2-byte instruction there, 
execute the two byte instruction, move over two bytes, throw away the old two bytes, or branch. If you're on a two byte boundary, you pull the next two bytes in atomically. If that's a two byte instruction, lovely, execute it. If it's not a two byte instruction, it's a misaligned four byte. I hate it when they do that. You move over two bytes, grab the next two bytes atomically, glue them together, execute, move the program counter four bytes or branch. Now your hardware has to give this level of atomicity as a minimum. You do not have to build it this way. This is just the minimum atomicity in your instruction fetch that's required to not tear instructions in half. So now that we've managed to not tear the instructions in half while we're executing and modifying them at the same time, you know, what value can we get from an ifetch when we're doing this sort of craziness? So let's imagine we're going to do a data write of x0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and we're going to do that to a given location that's an instruction. You're going to ask, what value can you fetch? Why the side? You can fetch any or all of them. To add insult to injury, repeated fetches get to go back and pick again. So a sequence like this, x30312, that bounces all around in here, is entirely legal. Okay? So if you're just modifying the instruction over and over and over again without changing anything, the fetchers are allowed to get all sorts of stale images in weird patterns. Now, this has eventually got to come to an end, right? You know, we want people to start executing X4 and stick to X4. So the way we do that is you execute a clean, which pushes X4 down to memory where it'll be fetched. You do the fence, then you do the invalidate. Once you do this sequence, whatever the coherent last value in memory is, is what you're going to execute from that point forward, and you'll drop off all of these answers up here. Okay? So let's look at how this plays out in a JIT. So again, that pattern I told you, this is one thread creating a new set of instructions. We've got heart one over here that's executing an old version with a branch to that. So heart zero, the JIT, creates the new instructions down here. Then we do a CMOD X store here, which actually directly modifies the instruction. Now, again, as we talked about, not everybody sees this update instantly, right? You can still see the old value. If you want to make sure people are going to see it, your heart that's creating it can do this, the clean, the fence, and the inval over here to make everybody catch up more quickly rather than just waiting for it to propagate out and fall out of your eye caches. Once we've modified that, we're now branching to this new code and we're running. Unfortunately, I just lied to you. That doesn't work, at least without a new rule. The reason that doesn't work is you can, you can at very beginning, at the early beginning of time, you can fetch in this code image right here, but that's stale. And then you put in a buffer after your eye caches that just holds on to it. Call it the post iCache iCache, right? He holds on to it. You then run all of the rest of this, and you get to this point, and when you start to go to execute that, you reach over into your post iCache iCache, and you grab stale instructions, and it's a bad day. So to fix that problem, we need one more rule, which is the instruction fetch ordering rule. Fetch ordering rule basically says you are, let me see if I can get this right, you are not allowed to execute an instruction. No instruction that comes later can be executed. You can't execute an instruction later that was fetched earlier than any prior instruction. So what you're guaranteed with the fetch ordering rule is when you get the, through this branch to new, that every instruction you're gonna fetch and run after that came later in time. So what that does is that solves the problem where you miss coming through here and I don't have to put an import.i in here. Now, why don't we have that? Because WebAssembly doesn't have this. In about 2017, somebody figured this problem out. We all figured out, oops, we better fetch in order because certain JITs do this and they just demand this works without an import.i. So let's look at a second JIT example. Now, again, the setup's pretty much the same. We've got the guy producing the code over here. He's producing the new code down here. Now, except in this case, we're not jumping, we're not modifying a branch instruction, we're gonna modify a value in a jump table. And we're gonna to branch to that value in the jump table here. Now we're gonna do a load and a branch here. Now in between them here, I've got this seemingly silly little dance where we look at the value that we loaded, 
we compare it to some number, it doesn't matter what, and then we branch to the very next instruction. So this is effectively a dummy dependency that doesn't do any functional work. But what it does do is it causes there to be an import here in the path. The import, it causes there to be an unresolved branch in front of the import. One of the things import does, uses to know not to fire too early is it resolves all the branches. So we have to, whenever you're modifying data, you have to look at the data and have a branch based on that in front of the import, okay? So when is import.i required? If you're doing cmod x, like you saw in that first example, you pretty much don't need import.i because the in order fetch rule saves you. It fixes the problem. If you're going through data, if you're modifying data in a jump table using that and then jumping to the value out of the data, you don't, that's coming through data that's not coming through the instruction machinery and therefore the in order fetch rule won't save you. So you actually have to put the import.i in. Now nobody likes the import.i because it costs performance and we'd prefer not to have that. So the last JIT technique we're gonna look at tries to straddle the middle ground. We call this game bait and switch. Again, it starts with the same setup over here. We're creating the new instructions at new here, but instead at new, the first instruction in new now is an import.i itself, okay? So this code will fix itself. You'll notice I don't have the dummy branch in here because there's always an import.i here in the way instead. So every time you come through here, the pipe gets cleaned and flushed. Now, the astute in the audience will go, wait, that's no good. You know, that doesn't help. You still have the import.i in there. Well, the nice thing about this example is once we get the new instructions put in place and change the branch target, we can then do a store of no op and overwrite that import and it will work. So what you do is you set these buffers up at the beginning of time with the import.i's in them, and then the import.i's are in there and they will catch the edge cases where you're just changing the code and fix them. And then once you've got the code delivered into here, you can erase the no-op because you don't need it anymore. Okay? Last point is coherent ID caching. A lot of times I give this talk about this and people get very upset because they all know just how expensive a globally broadcast iCache kill is and a globally broadcast clean instruction is. And I agree with him wholeheartedly. I haven't built the machine that did this since about 1997. Okay, so if your machine gets big, those globally broadcast things are a pain. But the good news is this is compatible. If you have coherent iCache, your iCache and dcaches are coherent, you can lead most of the microarchitectural effects of the inval.i and the clean ID because the store is doing the work of going through and knocking down your iCaches and your dcaches at the same time. So the coherence protocol figures out who to knock down, knocks them all down, and does a lot of the work for you, and you can lead several of the microarchitectural steps. And I think that's about all I had to say. Did I make it under time, Jeff? Excellent. Questions? Concerns? Is anybody still awake? Sure. All right. No. I have a microphone. And John's loud. We do not want to encourage him by asking too many questions. But OK, yes. And who has a question for Derek? Clear in the back. All right. Yes. Yeah, just repeat the question once he, once he asks it. It doesn't, if you're, the question is, if you have coherent IND caches, how does your code sequence change? And the answer is, if you're smart, it shouldn't. Because if you, yeah, well, I, I wasn't making any assertions, but um, if it's smart and if you want your software to be portable, it doesn't. Those instructions basically go to no ops. You should just leave them in there. So your software is portable and it just doesn't hurt anybody. It depends on exactly how coherent you are and how your implementation is built. You start getting down to the murky world of microarchitecture, how many of them you might be able to truly no op or remove. But in the spec, we're gonna, seri we're gonna strongly suggest that people stick to the sequence, the architected sequence, period, because that's what's gonna work everywhere.
clean ID goes away because your store is going to knock down your, your caches, your iFetches. Well, clean ID may go away. If your iFetching is coherent and your, and your IND caches are coherent, that works. If your iFetching actually goes straight to memory, but you make your stores update your iCaches, you still need the clean ID. So exactly which instruction you can get rid of is a dicey game of exactly the details of what you did and didn't do, right? And that's a whole 20 minute conversation over beer somewhere. Anybody else? Behind you, Jeff. All right, let's stump him this time, okay? <laughs> I spent a long time on this, Jeff. Hi, Derek. It's Cliff, it was nice to meet you at lunch. Hi, Cliff. Uh, love the presentation and the technical detail and the attention to detail that you present in this. My Thank prior you. after watching your, your talk is, yeah, 95% chance that this works and he's got all the details right. But my question is, beyond your experience in getting these kinds of things to work in the past where you have all the scars on your arms, I can see them. Yeah, yeah. Are there stronger proofs of the correctness of this system? Have you gone formal on it? Have you done all sorts of like <laughs> buzz testing and tried oh, to break I it love it all when people the crazy adversarial things? Because, you know, okay. these, these things are hard to get let's, right. Let's, yeah, okay. What is the proof I have right? Arm and we have been doing this 20, 20 plus years each time, and this has never been us. Okay, so that's step one. If you ask me the, you know, the formal answer, the problem with formal proofs are you have to know how to cast your problem into a formal system, and you have to know exactly that the question you wrote really is the question you asked for. If you have time, I will give you the 20 minute lecture on Warren Hunt and I and grayscale counters, and the only thing I really learned in my theorem proving formals class, right? But formals, formal is difficult in that this is really complex to prove, and you can only do it on a, you could do it on a small paper tinker toy, but even then you have to be sure that the question you ask the formal tool is actually the question that means this works. And that's ridiculously harder than most people realize and that it should seem it should be. Anybody else? And yes, we're pretty sure it works. That was an 87% answer by my guesstimation. Yes, but it was pretty good. Right. Well, you don't have an hour and a half for me to talk you through the whole answer, Jeff. I told you I dropped the mic at 20 minutes. Uh, these okay. people want to go to question. dinner. Alan, here, uh, I got a chance for another really good question. Yeah, I know. Well, this might be a really stupid question. I mean, there's a whole series of, of um, instructions you have to execute. Uh -huh. um, and a high performance processor, they try to execute as many instructions as they can in parallel. Are these always going to be serially executed? I mean, like completion defenses effectively. You're pointing, at, you're pointing at the clean and the inval.i in the sequence. And the unfortunate part for you is that you really, really do have to get the modification of the instruction down where the fetchers can see it before you blow away the iCaches. Because if you blow away the iCaches before you get that modification down, they will refetch the stale image. And it's a bad day again. You get to be in labs a lot. Vice presidents are unhappy. People get laid off. You know, children don't get educated. Bad things happen. <laughs> the unfortunate answer is yes, and that's what motivates the CMOD X to do it. So you don't have to do it all the time. Yeah, that's why the JIT people like CMOD X. They don't have to do the full dance. State that again, just so people can hear it. John pointed out that the reason for CMOD X is so you can avoid all the invals and the cleans and the whatever. Now you'll notice that I cleverly, where did I put it? You know, the problem with CMOD X is that it doesn't hit everybody immediately. So that's what this is here for. If you really want to be sure, I mean, it could be a long time on a heart before it rolls out of your three meg iCache and you start seeing the change. It could be a really long time, so you do this to cause that to happen. But the idea is they don't want to do a full dance here on this branch change. They just want to let it propagate somewhat loosely and then do this as optional if they care about how fast people pick it up. Okay. Anybody else? Or is Jeff I'm now lost. Who has the last question? All right. Well... It sounds like it's break time. It Thank like you very much, Derek. Let's give him a round of applause. Well. Thank you.